Good afternoon and welcome from the Institution of Mechanical Engineers to this webinar, A Net Zero North Sea, the oil and gas industry's role in the energy transition. My name is Dr. Tim Fox and I'm chair of the institution's Process Industries Division Board. It is a particular pleasure today to be chairing this webinar, which is our division's prestige AGM lecture. Under normal circumstances, this presentation would have been taking place this evening in the lecture theatre of our HQ building at One Birdcage Walk in central London. But it is excellent to be able to now host this, uh, this talk online where so many more of you can join us today. The oil and gas industry is a core area of process industries work. And it is a pleasure in this regard to be introducing today's speaker on such an important topic. Martin Tullock is Net Zero Solution Center Manager of the Oil and Gas Technology Center. He leads the center's uh, work and is passionate about ensuring that the oil and gas industry helps enable the transition, transition to a low carbon future. A chartered engineer, He's worked in both the oil and gas and renewable energy sector over the last 20 years. And is therefore well placed uh, to give us this insight today into the, uh, the way in which the energy transition can be supported and helped by the oil and gas industry. Martin works tirelessly to support the development of technologies that create employment and export opportunities while simultaneously tackling the greatest challenge of our age, decarbonizing um, and, and getting us to net zero. Martin, over to you. Good evening, everyone. I'd like to start by asking you to cast your minds back 15 years to 2005. Given that it's a US presidential election year, I thought it was um, quite pertinent to include this image. George W. Bush was being inducted in early 2005 in his second term. This man here was one of the rising stars, having just been elected to the Senate, Barack Obama. And I was working for Wood in Aberdeen on a project looking at extending the life of the Magnus oil and gas platform. So it was probably the biggest brownfield project in the North Sea at the time. We were looking at installing four conductor slots on the outside of the Magnus jacket. Each of the conductor slots had um, two conductors were able to run through those. So it was a fantastic project. We had a lot of subsea work, a lot of um, quite complex structural and, and piping engineering as part of this project. But about halfway through the year, I noticed an advertisement for a post in the Outer Hebrides leading some low carbon energy projects. It was just that quite an intriguing opportunity working for the local authority. So for the next two years, between 2005 and seven, I lived in Stornoway, a beautiful part of the country, and we developed a lot of renewable energy projects. This is probably the most high profile one. So we installed a green hydrogen system, taking the renewable power, generating hydrogen, storing that and ultimately using it in post vans that ran around the islands. And this is one of the first times that I actually appreciated the crossover between oil and gas skills and experience and those that will be needed to develop low carbon projects. Now, this is a very small scale project but the piping, the engineering design, the construction and the safety skills, it, this is very similar. But fast forward 15 years and I am now with Oil and Gas Technology Centre in Aberdeen. I lead our Net Zero Solution Centre. The OGTC as an organisation is just over three years old. We were established in early 2018. We've got quite a unique funding mechanism. We're partly funded by the UK government, partly by the Scottish government through the Aberdeen City and Region deal. In the three years that we've been in existence, we've invested £56 million of our own money and we've managed to attract over £92 million from industry for a combined investment of £149 million in technology development projects. We've screened just over a thousand technologies. We've invested in 237 projects. And quite importantly, we've had 54 field trials either completed or in practice at the moment. And in addition to that, we've got almost as many field trials planned. Now, pre-lockdown, something we used to pride ourselves in was that we are a, an amalgamator of get people together to talk about projects, to seed projects, to develop projects. 
And, and just across that lies a lot of ideas. Um, and that's something that we're continuing to do in, in, in the online world. But in terms of the, the journey to net zero, I thought um, I'd give you a quick overview of some of the technology focus areas first. When we were established, we were focused primarily on some of the problems that industry brought to us. So things like asset inspection, reducing the cost of decommissioning, optimizing production. But we also always had it as part of our agenda to look at the transform tomorrow, the, the right hand slide of the slide. So looking at what could we do to help the oil and gas industry evolve and, and play a role in the energy transition. So there's a bit of background, I thought it'd be just good to set the scene by looking at the, the, the context and, and why this is such an important issue. So what I've done in this slide is I've um, broke the last two and a half centuries down into 50 year chunks. I'm looking at energy use and percentage times over that period. In the early 19th century, um, with the advent of steam locomotion, coal, the, the black chunk here, started to play a role in the energy mix. Up until then, pretty much 100% of our energy use was from biomass and wood. And then in, 50, in the, the following 50 years, coal started to play a, a really important role in the world's energy supply mix. In the early 20th century, you started to see oil, gas, and electricity have, have more of a role to play. We had um, assembly line production with the advent of mass transportation, certainly in, in the West. And then between 1950 and 2000, that's when you really saw oil take off as the predominant source of global fuel. Now, what will the next 30 years hold? Um, that is the, the, the question that we're going to take a look at today. You can see the red and the yellow chunks there, wind and solar power are predicted to play an increasing role. Um, coal is going to diminish, oil is going to diminish, natural gas is probably going to increase its importance. But to really appreciate the impact, you've got to look beyond percentage terms and look at actual energy used. And that's what I do in this next graphic. So looking in um, millions of terawatt hours, post-1950 was a huge explosion in global energy use. And that was driven by a number of things, predominantly increase in the, in the world's population and rises in living standards. So what you see here is global population, which remained relatively constant between 1800 and the early 20th century, growing hugely post-1950. And of course, at the same time as, as we, we had that, we had um, an increase in carbon in the environment, shown in the black line here. And that has led to a corresponding increase in global temperature. If you look at the IPCC's recommendations about what needs to happen to our global carbon levels, what you've got here is um, current policies and pledges that show a, a plateau at best. And in reality, we need to make a huge decrease in that carbon profile. So we've got the IPCC one and a half and two degree scenarios here, showing that the vast gap between where we are today and where we need to be in the next 30 years. So then taking a look at the sources of carbon, this is looking at a European level. So what I show here is trying to communicate a couple of, of issues. And the key one is that we have seen quite dramatic decreases in the carbon intensity of our energy supply over the last decade and a half. But if you look at the transport sector, agriculture, industry, heat, there's hardly been any movement. And the huge challenge that we face as an industry, as a society, indeed, over the next three decades is to get to net zero. We need to see huge decreases across all of these sectors. Now, the work that we do in the Oil and Gas Technology Centre's Net Zero Group is focused around a number of scenarios, a number of strategies. And one of the foremost was the Net Zero Technical Report published by the Committee on Climate Change last year. Now, this is a fantastic report, um, over 200 pages long. It's supported by a, a huge amount of analysis. But if you boil it down to its core principles, there's three things that the CCC are recommending that we need to do, three really important things. So to get to net zero as a country, the UK needs to greatly increase the amount of electricity in the mix. Yep. At the moment, we produce just over 300 terawatt hours as a country. We need to more than double that by 2050. And quite rightly, the Committee on Climate Change predict that in the UK, 
the most cost effective way to increase our low carbon electricity capacity is to build offshore wind. But interestingly, if you look at the light, the blue chunk here, gas with carbon capture and storage, we actually need more gas power or more gas electricity in 2050 than we have today to balance the intermittent renewables. The second strand that we need is hydrogen. So these two bar charts show you hydrogen demand and production according to the CCC. And um, this is the further ambition scenario. So demand is from sectors that are impossible or hard to electrify. So heavy transport, trains, trucks, ships, heating, industrial processes. And again, it's interesting to see um, the baseline prediction of where that hydrogen supply will come from. So a large part of that will be blue hydrogen. So taking natural gas, stripping out the carbon and using the hydrogen. There is a role for, for green hydrogen electrolysis via renewable energy. And as a solution centre, we're quite adamant that we will be focusing on both those areas to try and reduce the cost of both electrolysis and steam methane reformation or alternatives. And then the third strand is carbon capture and storage capacity and hopefully usage indeed. So the CCC predict that we need 176 megatons per year capacity in 2017, which is a, a huge capital investment challenge. Now, what I've done in this next slide is just try and give you a, a sense of the potential scale of the opportunity. So in the Net Zero Solution Centre, we're focused on four areas. We want to decarbonise existing offshore oil and gas production, and at the same time, look at the potential to develop hydrogen production, carbon capture and storage, and indeed integrate the industry with the offshore renewable sector. So in 2018, the UK oil and gas sector produced £24 billion pounds worth of value. It's simply production times market prices. The offshore wind base, if you look at the um, quite conservative £40 pounds a megawatt hour, that's a £2 billion pounds revenue per year industry, and there's nothing in carbon capture or hydrogen at the moment. And all that we've done is we've walked that out to meet the Committee on Climate Change's 2050 target and um, assume that the mix that they assumed. So oil and gas production will decline. 2018 prices will still be producing £11 billion pounds worth of value from the UKCS in a net zero UK. Offshore wind, if we get to the 75, 80 gigawatts installed capacity base, that will be roughly £16 billion pounds of revenue opportunity. In hydrogen at £2 pounds a kilogram, you're talking about £13 billion and carbon storage using at a 50 pounds a tonne conservative assumption, that could be a 9 billion industry. And all we're trying to say here is that in quite simplistic terms that the industrial opportunity for the UKCS could be almost double what it is today by 2050. So a little bit of background on oil and gas now. If you look at UK oil production profiles over the last 40 plus years, Back in the early 70s, when we had the, the oil shocks, we were a, a huge importer of oil. And the first fields came on mid 70s, and we eventually became an exporter of oil. You saw the dip there following Piper Alpha and the, the mid 80s oil price crash. But we are a decreasing, declining production basin. We're a mature basin. Our oil demand is expected to remain relatively stable, although declining, as shown in this slide here. But the gap between our own indigenous production and demand is expected to increase hugely. You get the same sort of picture if you look at our gas demand in production. So not quite so well, no gap at the in the early days because we converted our sort of demand to suit natural gas. Um, the demand and supply profiles almost matched each other for a, a couple of decades. But again, you, you've got an increasing gap between our ability to produce gas from the UPCS and the country's expected demand. And if you add those two together, you get the profile here, which is from Oil and Gas UK's Vision 2035 document. The purple line there is the baseline production forecast. The grey line is our demand. Even in an net zero UK in 2015, you can see there's still that gas demand. And the yellow line is the up upside scenario where we maximise production from the continental shelf and minimise egg imports. Now just to, to give a, a little bit of sense of scale, the, the offshore oil and gas industry, because it's beyond the horizon, is quite often a, an industry that's misunderstood or not known about, but we've got more than 320 fixed installations offshore. 
We've got over 20,000 kilometres of pipeline and um, we employ over 280,000 people in the UK. And there's quite a lot of oil and gas remaining between 10 and 20 billion barrels. So a simple $50 a barrel, that's um, 500 to to um, a trillion dollars of value. So a lot of potential value to the country there. And the asset infrastructure as well is something that can be that could be quite crucial as we move towards net zero. The industry itself for the first time this year published emissions reduction targets. These are operational scope one emissions reduction targets. So at the moment we've got a carbon footprint of 18.3 megatons of CO2 per year. We're targeting a 50% reduction by 2030. 90% by 2040, and ultimately a net zero basin by 2050. If you look at this on, on sort of a, a map um, showing where our assets are located, this is data from oil and gas, the Oil and Gas Authority's energy integration work. So a fantastic study. It's almost um, ready for publication. This is from a, an earlier sort of phased document that was published late last year. Basically, each of these blue circles represents an offshore installation. The bigger the circle, the greater the power demand. So you've got 2.1 gigawatts of electricity demand in the North Sea alone. If you look at the carbon footprint from that generation, um, electricity offshore is provided by quite inefficient open cycle gas turbines in general, sometimes using diesel as a fuel, although ordinarily it's natural gas. Um, if you look at their carbon footprint, it's anything between 13.2 and I think 14.6 is actually the most up-to-date figure. These figures are from last year's data. But what I'm trying to show here is that the carbon footprint offshore is bigger than the carbon footprint of any of the industrial clusters in the UK. It's roughly 3% of the UK's total carbon footprint. If we look where that carbon is generated, the vast bulk of it is from power generation equipment offshore. So naturally, a lot of our focus in the Oil and Gas Technology Centre will be on what can we do to decarbonise that. You also see the blue chunk there, flaring, is another big issue. So um, we're focusing on that from a technology perspective as well. Now, I don't want to spend too much time looking at operational emissions, but just to give you a flavour of some of the things that we're looking at, power from shore and electrification is going to be a key tool as we look to decarbonise offshore operations. So there's a number of options there from simply tying into the national grid to incorporating floating wind and various options in between. In addition to that, we're looking at modular carbon capture, which is the technology in the top there. We're looking at potentially using hydrogen or hydrogen blades as a fuel and gas turbines, and maybe also looking at using fuel cells offshore. There's a number of concepts that we're in the very early stage of investigating. But I joined the OTTC in September last year, and before I joined, we actually had a number of projects where we implemented small-scale renewable solutions in the oil and gas sector. So I include two of them here. The one on the left is a wave power boy manufactured by Ocean Power Technologies. We deployed that in the Huntington field, which is decommissioned, and there's still subsea infrastructure left below the, the, the sea, which um, Potentially could have required a guard vessel um, until it was removed, but this wave powered boy was able to replace that. The one on the right is an interesting technology developed by a, a local company in the northeast of Scotland, a vertical axis tidal turbine that can operate in very low marine currents. So, typically, tidal turbines target currents of between one, two, two and a half metres per second, but this one can operate on a kilowatt scale in currents of 0.1 metres per second and below. And it's potentially an alternative to a power umbilical for opening and closing valves and doing some niche applications. But I really want to focus on the bigger picture in today's lecture. If you look at the remaining oil and gas reserves, um, I show it here on, on the map. We've got a lot of oil and gas reserves west of Shetland in the northern North Sea and um, in the central North Sea, and some indeed predominantly gas in the southern sector. We look at the countries offshore wind resource. The map on the left here is probably well known to most of the audience. It's from the UK government work of over a decade ago now. Basically, the darker the colour, the greater the wind resource, and there's some fantastic wind resource in UK waters. We looked more recently, Wind Europe, the trade body, produced this report late last year. And what you see here is the a map that shows how 
cost effective it could be to harness some of the offshore wind. So basically anything that's blue or dark blue is very low or low cost offshore wind potential. The UK is home to roughly 40% of Europe's low cost wind potential. Now for Europe to get to net zero, we need to be able to harness a lot of that. The North Sea and the, the Atlantic Basin are projected to be two of the key areas. But if you actually look at the Wind Europe report and the amount of that resource that's left untapped, so the light blue in these bar charts here, the vast bulk of the UK's low cost wind potential will remain untapped in a conventional development scenario. And that's where the potential for green hydrogen becomes really interesting. Now, as an organisation, the OGTC are quite keen to try and bridge the gap between sectors and indeed between countries. So this map here shows the situation today. You've got an oil and gas industry and offshore renewables industry basically operating as two separate entities, different regulators, different supply chains, different operators. And what we'd like to see as we move forward in the next three decades is a much more integrated North Sea. We'd like to see offshore oil and gas operations integrated with offshore renewable production. We'd like to see hydrogen being produced onshore and offshore, carbon stored offshore, energy being imported and exported to and from Europe, a much more joined up picture. And the title of this talk is the oil and gas industry's role in the energy transition. I feel that there's two things that are absolutely pivotal and they are the oil and gas industry's infrastructure and the people who operate and, and, and work in this sector. So the skills and infrastructure are going to be absolutely crucial to us. I tried to illustrate that in this map here, which shows you the existing gas infrastructure in red, oil pipelines in green, and potential carbon stores. So you've got natural gas fields as well as saline aquifers. And there's a huge overlap between the, the carbon storage capacity and uh, the pipeline infrastructure that we can reuse to tap into that. Capacity. Also, if you look at hydrogen, hydrogen is going to play a, a huge role if we, we want to move to net zero. There's a large imbalance between demand in winter and demand in summer, so we need the interseasonal storage capacity. Salt caverns have been proposed as one means of doing that, probably the most realistic. This map here shows you Europe's um, potential hydrogen storage options. If you look at that in tabular form or in bar chart form in this next slide, you can see that the UK has got the, the third largest potential in Europe for hydrogen storage and salt caverns, both onshore and offshore. I'd like to move on. Um, I've only got 20 minutes left, so looking at uh, a few more slides, these next couple of slides look at potential production profiles. It's from a piece of work that we've commissioned Wood McKenzie to undertake, and it's aligned with the, the CCC targets. But basically, we, we already know that oil and gas production will decrease dramatically over the next three decades, but still be a significant industry in 2050. If you look at our demand for wind, we need um, 300 terawatt hours, we need 75 to 80 gigawatts of installed capacity. And there will be a huge build out as we try and reach the offshore wind sector deal target in 2030. We'd love to see floating wind play a, an earlier role, and that's something that we're focusing on trying to reduce the cost of floating foundations in particular. And then looking at hydrogen production and, and carbon storage, again, we've just got our baseline projections here. We don't expect to see anything significant for the next five years. There's a lot of planning, a lot of infrastructure development needed, a lot of technology development as well. But come 2025, we need to see a huge build out in the country's hydrogen production capacity if we are to reach net zero. And exactly the same goes for carbon capture and storage. We've got a couple of really exciting pilot projects underway at the moment, but we need to see a much greater infrastructure investment in this sector. Now, a piece of work that um, some of you may have seen was um, something prepared by Element Energy, published by Exxonor last year, looking at the potential economic impact of a move to net zero for the UK economy. Now, I've just used copied one slide from that report in my presentation here, but just to give a sense of the potential scale of capital and operational opportunity. If you look at the, the three scenarios there, uh, sort of a, 
a very um, unambitious scenario and two quite ambitious um, decarbonisation scenarios. So we're talking about potential capital spend of 160 or 176 um, billion pounds, potential an annual operational revenues of um, 12, 13 billion. So a huge industrial opportunity awaits us if we can manage to, to get things together as, a, as an industry. And that's just looking at the UK opportunity. If you look at the European picture, a clean planet for all is the European Union's equivalent of our um, Committee on Climate Change report. And that basically has a number of scenarios. Um, I've tried to do a, a, a sort of middle scenario here for just for information, but we need a huge increase in onshore wind capacity to get to net zero as a, a continent. We need exactly the same in offshore wind. 450 is probably quite conservative. We also need a huge amount of solar power from Southern Europe and Africa, and of course, a, a consequent decrease in carbon power generation. Now, again, looking at the oil and gas industry's role, if you look at where Europe's um, high sources of energy demand are located, you've got the industrial and petrochemical clusters um, in Northern Italy and Germany and in the Netherlands, indeed in, in the north of the UK. And then look at where our carbon storage potential is, and the vast bulk of that is in the North Sea, both in the Norwegian, the Dutch, the UK sectors, but a huge amount of that is in UK waters. So we do have the opportunity to look beyond our own industrial emissions and look to help Europe decarbonise as a continent. And then thinking ambitiously, if you look at what's happening across the globe, um, numerous countries are looking at hydrogen as a potential export opportunity. So just one example here, Australia is looking at um, a number of sources that maybe quite controversially included their brown coal to hydrogen option here. They've also got great solar power and um, fantastic offshore wind in the south of the country. And they're close to a country it's got a very advanced industrial society with, with little resource, Japan. So again, it is natural for, for them to look at that as a potential export market. And the reason that that's important um, from my perspective is the potential employment opportunity. So we are commissioned, we've commissioned a piece of work at the moment that's almost ready for publication, looking at what that could, what the impact of that could be for the UK. Uh, I can't share that with you at the moment, but what I can share is a comparable study that was completed in Norway last year. And they're looking at the hydrogen opportunity as potentially being a, a 20 billion pound, a 220 billion krona um, opportunity in, by 2050, providing 25 to 35,000 jobs. They're also looking at the potential to um, import CO2 and store it offshore, and with ripple effects that could produce upwards of 100,000 jobs. So that's the scale of opportunity that we stand on the cusp of. And if you, if you look at what the impact that that can have on local communities, I was quite fortunate four or five years ago to spend three months as project director on the Hawenni Brim upgrade in the NIG fabrication site in the north of Scotland. Now that project had a workforce of 1,500 at its peak, 900 on day shift, 600 on nights. And it was fantastic, the buzz that that gave to the local community, the, the, the sense of excitement and, um, and also the, the, the sense of achievement for the workforce to see that the, the fabrication that they were working on come to life. And that's very similar to what we used to have in the UK from the, the mid-70s onwards uh, across the country in the fabrication yards. So I'll show you the Magnus platform here that I shared in one of my first slides being towed out from the MIG dock in the, the early 80s and the largest track has been installed in the North Sea. If you look at the employment impact from that fabrication era, where we had two decades of significant fabrication work, on this next slide here, sorry for the, the delay there, but in this next slide, you show the work, you see the workforce at the NIG yard over those two decades and the projects they're working on. So it peaked at almost 5,000 people in the late 70s. A lot of peaks and troughs, a lot of layoffs and rehires. So we need to make sure that we do the energy transition in a much more just and fair manner. So in terms of national impact, I'd like to touch briefly on a couple of projects that we at OGTC are in the early stages of developing. One of the most impactful of those is looking at energy transition hubs. Now this is a solution 
that we feel has got huge replicability across the UK. Anywhere you've got great renewable energy resource and a connection to the UK gas grid, we could potentially implement this solution. So everywhere from Solenbow in the north down to Milford Haven in, in the southwest and lots of of um, sites in between. The actual concept itself is based on work that the Oil and Gas Authority are uh, almost able to publish. Um, there's five energy integration concepts as part of the energy integration scope. The most ambitious of those was the energy hub concept in the bottom right here. So basically using a, an onshore site where you can combine oil and gas production with renewable energy, potentially doing power from shore from that site, um, and, and ultimately producing blue and green hydrogen. Our initial focus is going to be in the Shetland Islands. The Shetland is home to the Sullenbow oil terminal, which has been the reception point for over 40% of the UK's oil over the last four decades. It's a great piece of infrastructure. It's connected to the UK gas grid now. It is adjacent to the West of Shetland Basin, which is home to 25% of the UK's proven reserves. And if you look at play level, um, it's, it's home to over 50% of the UK's potential play level reserves. So that's oil and gas that's, that's yet to be discovered, but um, the geological potential exists for it. Also adjacent to the best offshore wind resource in Europe, east and west of Shetland. So what we're looking at this, for this project is a range of things. Initially, looking at power from shore for some of the developments that are planned west of Shetland, so potentially Clare South, potentially Rose Bank. There's a number of existing assets as well that we could decarbonise by electrification. But after that, we'd be looking at producing blue hydrogen. You've got gas import potential there. You could import gas as well as produce our own offshore gas, and ultimately looking at green hydrogen. So from a technology perspective. We at the OGTC are really interested in a whole host of technologies, and this project covers um, the vast bulk of those. So everything from power from shore, as I mentioned on the left here, looking at technologies to decrease the cost of that, through blue hydrogen production, green hydrogen production, and, and innovative storage technologies as well. So very much in the early stage of developing this project, and it's something that um, we look forward to working on in partnership with a number of industrial organisations. The other project I want to mention briefly is the European Hydrogen Backbone. Now, um, forgive the low definition of these images, but the, the, the two that I first discovered um, probably about a decade ago, I can't even remember where, so I haven't referenced them here, so apologies if they come from one of your own presentations. But what we have here is a map showing Europe's gas infrastructure in 1970. So a few hubs around some of the major conurbations, nothing offshore. And in the space of three decades, the oil and gas industry changed that from, from that picture to this picture here. So a huge integrated network of gas distribution and production facilities in, in the North Sea connected to um, to Northern Europe, you've got gas coming in from Russia, you've got a lot of import terminals, you've got gas being piped across the Mediterranean. And that's the sort of scale of infrastructure build out that we're going to need if we want to get to net zero. So again, we're in the early stages of looking at getting involved in the European hydrogen backbone proposal. So this originally was a Dutch initiative, um, the brainchild of, of two Dutch academics. And it's looking at repurposing some of the existing offshore gas pipeline network to accommodate green hydrogen production. So tapping in the offshore wind in the North Sea, looking at um, solar power electrolysis from North Africa and Europe, and indeed wind from North Africa as well. It's a great potential to really decarbonise Europe through this project. I don't have a lot of time to look at the detail in this presentation, but I would point everyone in the direction of the Green Hydrogen for a European Green Deal, the two times 40 gigawatt initiative paper, which gives a, an in-depth overview. Basically, you'd be looking at producing huge amounts of electricity in Europe and North Africa. You can see some of that going straight into electricity grids, some going into electrolysis from, from wind and solar power. And um, then you've got the, the end use on the right-hand side and some of the losses. So not enough time to cover this in detail here, but just an indication of an early stage projects that we're looking at. Now, before we wrap up, I've only got a couple of slides left, but I thought it'd be quite nice, or not nice, but quite important to remind ourselves why this is such an important issue. 
So this is a, a graph that really hit home for me from The Economist last year. And it's basically looking at fossil fuel power plants or coal power plants across the globe. And the ones that have opened in the last five decades, they're in dark blue. So there's a, a huge existing fleet and of um, high carbon electricity plants. And you look at the scale of the challenge. What I show in this chart here is the UK's energy consumption, consumption in red. Europe's in blue. So again, quite stable, a slight decline predicted over the next couple of decades. And then look at the global picture. So the global challenge is truly enormous. You can see uh, if India's population improves its standard of living as their middle cla class grows, there's going to be a, a large demand for power there. And um, the same sort of thing happening in, in China and other parts of, of the world. So we face as a society a huge challenge here but it's also a huge opportunity. The reason it's important is the impact that climate change is going to have for all of us. We talk about the one and a half and a two degree change in average temperature but if you look into the data and see the impact that that could have on especially on the, the, the hottest days so you can see great swathes of southern Europe with a four five six degree change in average average temperature on the hottest days in summer that could make large parts of, of the world uninhabitable. You've also got the impact that it'll have on water from an engineering perspective. I'm a, a chartered civil engineer myself. Um, water supply is a core part of what civil engineers are involved in. Um, we're going to see a large impact on a lot, especially a lot of the poorest people in, in, in the, the world. As this water stress increases, and that has a knock-on impact on agriculture. And then if you look at the World Bank's um, projections of which regions are going to suffer most, pretty much all of Africa is going to suffer a, a large decrease in its agricultural productivity, as well India and a lot of Southeast Asia. So then finally, my last slide to try and sum things up. It's one of my favourite images taken during the, the Apollo missions of the air. And it, to me, it sort of emphasises that sense of adventure and ambition that we as an industry are going to need to meet the challenge of net zero. When I was a, a kid growing up in the Orkney Islands in the north of Scotland, that was a, a time when a lot of these large projects were being developed. I remember the shale adverts comparing the Brent field development to the space race, and, and that really had an impact for me as a schoolboy and was one of the things that was influential in my choice of STEM subjects. It's also, I remember distinctly as a, a young boy in the north of Scotland being taken to the coast one Sunday afternoon to watch the largest man-made structure in the world being transported from Kishon on the west coast of Scotland to its final operational site on the um, off Shetland. So that was the Ninian Central platform. And to me, that's the sort of sense of ambition that we as an industry need to rekindle to, um, to get to net zero. I'll just leave you with a couple of thoughts. I'm adamant that the energy transition isn't moving fast enough. I hope you appreciate the sense of scale and the sense of infrastructure investment that's going to be required locally, nationally, and globally to get to net zero. We need a economic mechanism, a carbon price or equivalent to drive that investment. So I think it's really important that we investigate options and, and lobby to make sure that we can implement something. But again, it's the global challenge that ultimately will have to be applied globally. But in terms of oil and gas, it's sector's ability to make a, a change here and to have an impact. There's three key things I think that we can bring to the table. We've got a history of safe operations, which is going to be absolutely essential to build up this infrastructure. We've got a workforce that's skilled and experienced in developing big projects. And we've got that history of technological innovation that's going to be absolutely essential to drive the new technologies and to reduce the price point of existing technologies to enable us to reach net zero. So I'd just like to wrap up by thanking everyone very much for um, for attending today. We've got 20 minutes left for Q&A and I very much look forward to your questions, your challenges. I'd, I'd um, welcome any challenges to any of the assumptions that I've made and um, thank you.
Thank you, Martin, for such a fascinating and insightful talk covering so many key aspects of technical and commercial challenge. I found it really uh, interesting. Um, it's now my pleasure to introduce John Clegg, Chair of the Process Industries Division's Upstream Oil and Gas Committee, who will uh, chair the Q&A session. Um, over to you, John. Thank you, Tim. And uh, thank you, uh, Martin, for uh, an excellent uh, presentation. We, a number of questions have come in, uh, a number of different topics, and I'll try and get through as many as I can. Um, the, the, the first one I'll say is that you know, during the presentation, you, you identified the need for sort of joined up co coordination between um, uh, the existing offshore oil and gas industry and uh, emerging uh, sort of wind, um, sort of uh, green and blue uh, hydrogen. And uh, who would take the lead in pulling that together? Is that a role for industry or a role for government? And what's the level of understanding and commitment at this time from the UK government in your experience? Yeah, that, that's a really good question, Sean. I think um, it's definitely something that's going to have to be a combination of industry and government working together. Um, and even within industry, I, I mentioned on the, the map there that we've got an oil and gas sector and an offshore wind sector that historically haven't worked together. But we've seen um, a huge appetite in both industries to, to um, try and seize the, the challenge here. We're, as an organisation, OGTC has built strong links with Scottish Renewables, UK Renewables, a number of developers. So I think that the onus is on us to actually, from an industry perspective, show what's achievable and, and where we need to focus our attention. And again, our, our experience of government has been very positive. They've been, they appreciate the scale of the challenge. They know that they've got to try and prime some of the um, the technology that's going to be needed. So both at UK, Scottish and, and European levels, we've had really good engagement. So I think it, it will take a concerted effort from both industry and government to to tackle the challenge here. But um, the, early, the early sort of indications are that um, we, we can do this together. That, that, that's, that's good, that's good to hear. And um, a, a couple of people have pointed out that um, there is a, a lot of investment is going to be needed to uh, achieve net zero for the North Sea. And they're asking, where do we think the investment is going to come from? And um, is, the, uh, is, is the carbon price that you just spoke about in the final slide something which is a prerequisite before any real developments take place? Or will this kind of work attract funding um, absent a carbon price? Yeah, again, my, my opinion, I think it's, it's quite a widely held opinion, is that um, we may get a few demonstration projects, grant funded projects, but we need some sort of carbon price. Uh, I noticed in the Committee on Climate Change's annual update that was published last week, we talked about an enduring market mechanism, which is a much more eloquent um, description of what I was trying to say with the economic carbon price. We need some sort of um, framework to encourage investment. Uh, again, I noticed in the, the Financial Times this morning talk about a green investment bank, which um, I think would be welcomed. We had that previously looking predominantly at onshore wind. Um, so I think there's two things we need, some sort of mechanism, and ultimately it's got to be global. Um, you, you saw the scale of the challenge, and that, that is going to be the real conundrum is how do we try and implement that? And that's ultimately one for the politicians, but um, it's also one for, for everyone. We're all part of the of the society that's going to have to tackle this, this huge challenge. Um, so, so definitely I think we do need government to show some sort of leadership here. We need a mechanism, but we also need the private sector to really step up to the plate and start funding some of these projects. And these are huge infrastructure investment projects, so we need to start with the planning in the early stages right now. Okay, thanks. Um... And um, I guess sticking with the, the, the theme of the, 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 the first question, at least, uh, the existing infrastructure we've got, and you, you, you talk quite a bit about the existing infrastructure we have in the um, sort of uh, UK sector, um, you know, sort of platforms, pipelines, vessels, and so on. And how much of that do you think can be repurposed um, in your net zero 2050 vision? Uh, how much of the existing infrastructure? 
Yeah, that, that, that's a really good question again. I can't give an exact um, percentage for that one, but it's certainly a, a focus of a lot of our work at the moment in partnership with, with industry, with the infrastructure owners and um, the groups that are using the infrastructure. Hydrogen, as, as we're all aware, is uh, it's, it's the smallest molecule. It's got issues with embrittlement of steel work. So there, there's a lot of challenges. There's a, a lot of potential um, renovation options. We could look at coating pipelines to make them more suitable for hydrogen transport. So again, I, I don't have an answer to that one. We, we do feel from some of the early studies that we've done that a significant proportion of the pipeline network certainly could be repositioned. And, and hopefully some of the, the assets as well, the, the fixed and, and subsea assets offshore. Thanks for that. And uh, there were a, a couple of questions about um, other sources of power that were um, not considered in the mix so much for 2050. Um, I think one of them, uh, nuclear power, and the other one was, uh, I think it was uh, biomass. And where do you see those being in our energy mix in uh, 2050? Yeah, let's start with the less controversial one, biomass. That is certainly part of the Committee on Climate Change's further ambition scenario. They, they have got biomass in there. They've actually got the, the um, biomass with carbon capture and storage as a, a nominally carbon negative technology. Um, so I think that will have a role to play. Nuclear, is, as far as I'm aware, is not part of that core scenario. Um, personally, I think that it would be interesting to look at SMR, small modular reactors, and to, to see what sort of role they may have. Um, it's not part of our focus as oil and gas um, solutions, and, uh, the net zero solutions centre, certainly, because none of our member companies and, and none of the strategies that we're working to include it. But certainly from a, a scientific principles perspective, um, it, it's something that I personally feel we shouldn't rule out. Um, but no, it is not part of our focus in the OGTC at the moment. Okay, thanks. And um, it's a question, uh, a couple of um, maybe more skeptical questions came in. Um, one was about how do you see CCS developing when um, there currently aren't any functioning systems? And um, where there's a, the, the, the question sort of asks how much CO2 is re-emitted to the environment uh, after capture? And um, another question asking about whether um, we should have a, a broader cross-vector approach, which um, sort of um, in, again includes, uh, I guess, nuclear as a uh, as a source. So I think the question really is about um, how do you see the future of CCS? I think I noted that um, in one of your slides you were saying that a lot of the CCS potential was under unknown projects or future projects, um, a large proportion of it. And could you comment yeah, a little I bit maybe on whether? Absolutely. I mean, it's, um, it is quite a, a controversial, probably the most controversial um, technology in the, the whole net zero debate. We as an organisation, we invited Mike Berners-Lee to give a fantastic presentation to our membership earlier this week. And um, I think he is from that, that side of the lobby that is very sceptical and, and uh, indeed rules it out. Um, if you look at the Committee on Climate Change, their update from last week, they, they stated that CCS is a necessity, not an option, a key pillar in, in achieving their net zero target. So it's certainly part of the Committee on Climate Change's approach at the moment. Again, I believe that the work that they're undertaking um, this year will ultimately develop a number of scenarios, um, some of which will be more heavily focused on the renewables. In terms of the technology itself, I mean, it, it has been deployed roughly uh, 20 plants, most of those in, in the US. Um, so the technology is proven from a, a capture point of view. Um, we need to make sure it's sufficiently low carbon. That's a, a technology challenge. There is um, the, the Snowbit project in Norway that's, that's currently operational and um, storing carbon. So it, it is a key plank of the existing strategy in, in the UK, but um, there will be technical challenges um, and cost challenges. I think that commercial framework is going to be absolutely crucial to stimulating some of these. So we've got a number of pilot projects planned at the moment. Um, we will need a huge increase. Again, the Committee on Climate Change talk about the minimum of five carbon capture hubs across the country. Um, and the other thing that I didn't really touch on in this presentation is carbon usage opportunities. 
which um, I, th I think is something that's got great potential. He can use carbon as a material, as a, a feedstock for, for simple protein development. There's a, a number of options that we'd like to look at in the medium to long term. So a bit of a rambling answer there, Sean, but ultimately I think from, from our perspective, we're very much focused on carbon storage as being a core part of the solution in the short term, but only as part of a transition to a 100% renewable society ultimately. Okay, thanks for that. Um, and then th there was a few questions about hydrogen as a fuel. Um, one of them about um, what policy do you think is needed around the infrastructure for hydrogen if it was going to be a uh, fuel for transport, things like uh, uh, sort of filling stations, tanks, nozzles, etc. There was a related question about um, um, what the anticipated cost of hydrogen at the point of use is going to be in 2050. And somebody else, a slightly uh, lighter note, said should they sell their um, battery-operated electric vehicle and buy a hydrogen uh, fuel cell vehicle instead? Yeah, when we're starting with a lighter note, um, I think hydrogen will have a role to play, not in light transport, probably in heavy-medium transport, um, so that the trains and the ships that I mentioned. And yeah, I don't want to dodge this question, but from an oil and gas industry perspective, from the OGTC strategy, we're very much focused on hydrogen production. But we do appreciate that, um, that, that there's an opportunity here, I think, for the UK to look at an end-to-end -end hydrogen vision, where we look at everything from production all the way through to end use, with the, the transport and storage piece in between. So I mentioned at the outset of the presentation the work I did in Outer Hebrides um, a decade and a half ago. And we had that hydrogen refueling station there. So I'm aware of some of the challenges that, that will be associated with rolling that out in a large scale. Um, but ultimately, I, I'm not really qualified to comment on on the, the, the detail at this stage. So I think our, our main focus will be on steam methane reformation and, and ATR and alternative hydrogen production techniques, as well as driving down the cost of electrolysis and the green power that's going to be required to feed that electroly electrolysis capacity. Okay. Um, I had a question about, which I guess is a pertinent and timely question, about COVID-19. And uh, to what extent is that going to change the roadmap to net zero and the financial capability the question says of the oil and gas sector, but I guess of, of the whole country to be able to make the needed changes and uh, investment. And I've seen some people very optimistic about um, our exit from COVID-19 accelerating the energy transition. And I've heard people be more pessimistic about, you know, where's the money going to come from? So where, what would your answer be there? And, and what's your position on that? Yeah, I, again, speaking in a personal capacity, um, in a professional capacity as well. We have seen obviously a decline in the oil price um, driven primarily by the, the reduction in demand over the last three months. And, and that, is, that has had a huge impact on the, the oil and gas industry's finances as it has, has had on every other sector of society. So yeah, there's a lot of pain at the moment. There's a lot of projects being postponed and re-evaluated in the short term. We're used as an industry to the ups and downs, uh, the peaks and troughs of oil price and the impact that has on our ability to develop and deliver projects. So I think there is that challenge. But the encouraging thing for me is that in the oil and gas sector, the, the operating community in particular has got a, a long term vision. We're all focusing on the opportunity and, and what needs to be done to move to net zero. So that sort of long term investment is still there. That that. That willingness and ability to invest in net zero projects is, is still there. And ultimately, I think as we move out of um, the, the COVID recession, there'll be a big focus on building back better, to use the term that was launched a couple of days ago. And I think that that's an opportunity for us to really look at making sure we make smart investments. We tie any investments in, in infrastructure to um, the net zero priorities. And we, we try and make sure that we create just employment opportunity as well. There's a lot of people employed in the oil and gas sector at the moment, a lot of great skills there that are going to be absolutely essential as we build out of of um, the situation we find ourselves in. So I, I do see challenge, but I do see huge opportunity as well.
Are you still there, John? Well, apologies, everyone. Um, we seem to have lost Sean Clegg from <clears throat> this webcast. Tim, I don't know if you can hear me. Do you want to come in and say anything? Hey, can anybody hear me now? Yeah, I, that's good. Okay, I'm back. Sorry about whatever technical problem was that. Um, apologies. I, I think the last question that I asked you was, um, the most recent question was about Brexit and how that uh, is likely to affect our connection to uh, Europe in terms of um, importing and exporting uh, sort of uh, energy, and whether that was. Yes, sorry, I didn't. Hear that. That's another really, really pertinent question. Um, I don't want to comment on the political implications of Brexit, but from a, an energy perspective, from a technical perspective, I think there's still a, a huge opportunity there. I mean, if you look at Norway, Norway is not a part of the European Union; that they're part of the ETA and. And they're still a huge energy supplier to Europe at the moment. Um, as Europe moves towards net zero, there will be a, a huge opportunity to provide low carbon power uh, into Europe. We as an organization are building links with TNO out of the Netherlands, with, with comparable organizations in Germany and France. And indeed, a lot of our membership are international companies operating across borders. So I, I see huge opportunity for, for Europe and for the UK to, to make sure we've got a a net zero supply, and, and also if you look at the potential manufacturing opportunity for the European and, and UK companies to manufacture the electrolyzers, the wind turbines, the, the pipelines that are going to be required to get to net zero, it's quite an exciting and um, a mouth-watering opportunity. Looks like we've maybe lost you again, John. Hello. Gotcha. Sorry about the technical issues here. Um, will the stored carbon in the long term become a problem which is um, similar to medium and low-level nuclear waste, something we have to live with for, uh, for but we kind of bequeath to future generations? Yeah, that, that's something we've got to avoid. And a lot of the work that we're doing at the moment is focused on... Um, monitoring and storing and making sure that that carbon will remain in place again if you look at some of the, the places we're looking to store it and um, disused gas reservoirs for example it, that's that's been the that, that's where it came out of initially so i don't want to gloss over that question it is uh, one of the most important things that our subsurface team is looking at at the moment so we've got a number of ge geologists and technical specialists in the subsurface sector looking at this um, but you're right, that, that's going to be something that we need to make sure. It, it'll never be as um, toxic as nuclear waste, hopefully, but we do need to make sure that we deal with that and have all the, the, the science in place before we implement any of these projects. Okay, good. Uh, I think we've got time for one final question. And um, this one, I, I, I picked this last, there's a the whole bunch of questions that people asked that there wasn't time to get through, so apologies to uh, anybody who asked the question that didn't appear. but. This one, I think, is pertinent to the, the kind of the purpose of the talk, and that is, what are the skills that the um, oil and gas industry can bring to and learn from the renewables industry? And I, I think it'd be good just to finish on uh, uh, just, just looking at what the core skills are that can be exchanged between them. 
Yeah, ab- absolutely. And um, we're doing a, a, a little bit of work in partnership with the Offshore Renewable Energy Catapult at the moment. So I've got a good feel for the, the skill sets across both organisations. You've got the project management skills that can be absolutely essential for delivering these projects on time and within budget. You've got not a lot of technical skills there. So the, the subsurface skills that I touched on, the carbon storage, you've got the, the mechanical and the piping and the structural skills for actually building this equipment. If we look at the manufacturing capacity, um, a number of the fabrication yards that I touched on, but also the, the, the sort of higher tech manufacturing capability that we've got in the oil and gas sector, there's the huge export potential there if we can get this right. And um, we've also got the, the project development, the financial, the environmental skill set that's required in oil and gas. So there's a, an absolutely colossal overlap between both sectors. There's a lot that we can learn from the renewable sector as well in terms of how they've driven down the cost of offshore wind. So really the, the onus is on us on both both industries to work together and to have these conversations and, and start sharing more of the, um, the technology that we have developed and, and some of our ideas for future technology. So uh, just to, to close, I've, I've seen a lot of really encouraging behaviours from both oil and gas industry and the renewables industry over the last 12 months in particular. So hopefully we can continue that over the next three decades and beyond. Okay, well, well thank you. Um, we had a few questions about um, whether the slides would be uh, available. Uh, there will be an on-demand recording of the webinar available to view uh, afterwards. And uh, in a few days' time, I think the presentation slides will also be available on request. And if anybody wants to make such a request, you should direct it to the IMECI's, uh event inquiries uh, team. So uh, in conclusion, on behalf of the Process Industries Division, I'd like to thank everybody in the audience for uh, joining. And uh, I, I think a lot of the questions that we got from the audience, add, you know, they would add a lot to uh, an event like this. So thanks, everybody, for joining, for listening, and for participating. And of course, on behalf of the division, I'd like to thank Martin for uh, putting together an excellent presentation. Um, thanks, everybody. <laughs>